snap. The kick is in the air, and the kick this time is no sir Ree. No sir Ree. Final score, Tennessee 20, Florida 17. Pandemonium reigns. You're listening to the RTI Podcast, powered by WalkingTopInsider.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the RTI Podcast. I am Nathaniel Rutherford, Managing Editor of WalkingTopInsider.com, joined again by Ben McKee, our staff writer here at RTI, and he's also the co-host and producer of the Swain Event Morning Radio Show. We appreciate all of you tuning in. If this is your first time listening to the RTI Podcast, Welcome in. We appreciate it very much. You can find the podcast in a multitude of ways. If you have an iPhone or an Android phone, either one of those, uh, we're easily accessed on both of those. Apple Podcasts on your iPhone or any Apple Apple device, and then whatever podcast app you use on Android, we should be able to be found on there as well. You can go to the website, rockytopinsider.com, click on the podcast tab up on the, the top right corner of the homepage. You can listen to the podcast right from that webpage, or you can download it from there. Uh, and also, I think you can download it, uh, you know, to your iPhone or Apple devices, either one from that webpage. And also the newest way you can access the podcast is on YouTube. Just search for our YouTube Rocket Top Insider on YouTube or it'll be on the webpage as well. And you can subscribe to us there because we have all kinds of stuff that we do on our YouTube channel. And that's also where you can kind of interact with the podcast a little bit more because you can leave comments and we can reply back to you or we can address you know some of the comments and stuff um, for a future podcast. So those are all the ways you can listen to the podcast, interact with us, and we appreciate every single one of you. Ben, we talked a lot this week in the first podcast. In fact, the first podcast this week was all about Tennessee's quarterbacks play, specifically you know, more about Garantano um, than the backups. We did talk about them a little bit. If we have time in this podcast, I think we'll kind of circle back around a little bit and, and talk about you know, Garantano and, and the, the quarterback situation at Tennessee just a little bit. That's because it's such a, a you know, big conversation this week. But because it's such a big conversation, it's also kind of been – almost talked to death a little bit this week as we're recording this on Thursday afternoon. I want to talk about a couple pieces of news that have happened since we last spoke here on the podcast. One of them, really, I think you could say the the biggest one, is that it looks like Bryce Thompson is going to be ready to go. Uh, Jeremy Pruitt announced on Wednesday that he has reinstated Bryce Thompson, sophomore cornerback, to the team. Um, He's returned back to practice. He's back on the practice field on Wednesday. Um, he's, He's with the team this week now. Pruitt, you know, kind of implied that he doesn't know if you know, he said he hasn't practiced, so I don't know if we'll see Thompson really much, if at all, against UTC. Um, I don't, you know, that's not, it would be. I think it wouldn't be a bad thing to get him in there just to get him some game action. But at the same time, like like Pruitt said, he hasn't been practicing for I mean two and a half, three weeks at this point, so it's kind of hard to play him. I don't imagine he's probably lost a whole lot of football knowledge and hasn't got that rusty in that short of time. But I'll be intrigued to see if he plays. And you also have the fact that. Linebacker Daniel Batuli is looking like he's actually going to be able to make his 2019 season debut this weekend after missing the first two games after going undergoing a minor knee procedure right there at the last couple weeks, last week of, of fall camp. And he's been out since then, just kind of making sure he's going to be healthy to get back. Ben, we were kind of asked this in our weekly mailbag on RockyTopInsider.com. I want to go to it in a little more depth, in-depth here we can, than we can just in a, you know writing about it and answering a question. Um, for the mailbag, but I I think the return of both Daniel Batuli and, and Bryce Thompson could have a a pretty significant impact. I, I didn't think about this until I heard actually, I think it was David Ubbin and Joe Rexrode on on the Athletic podcast. You know that they they do over on the Athletic for um, Tennessee football. It's called Pod for Life, which I, I recommend that if you have an Athletic subscription, they do a good job. Uh, David always always does a good job writing, but I think both those guys do a good job in the podcast format too. But it didn't really dawn on me that Tennessee. You know, we we talked about how many guys have had missing to start the season on defense with Thompson, Batuli, and then also with Emmett Gooden. Those aren't just three, you know, guys who played last year and are bringing back, you know, a lot of leadership and, and qualities that Tennessee's defense have missing. But then those are three guys at all three levels of the defense, which I, for some reason didn't dawn on me. It's it's a guy who you're counting on to be a significant contributor on the defensive line, a guy who's your leader and who gets the defense set up in your linebacking core, and then arguably your best defensive back um, in the secondary. 
So you're missing three key guys, and they're all in three different parts of, of the defense. It's not like you're missing two or three linebackers or two or three secondary guys, and you're, and you're still getting you know your front seven um, intact and fine. It's three three key guys in all every single area of the defense. I'll be very curious. I don't know how much either one of these guys will play against UTC, but Ben, the, the Tennessee's matchup with Florida is right on the horizon. Uh, it's next week. It's going to be a noon kickoff down in Gainesville. We'll talk more about that matchup next, but I actually think that if Tennessee's going to pull an upset, the noon kickoff does help them. I'm not picking them to do it, but I think a noon kickoff does help them. But we'll talk more about that next week. But ben, what kind of impact do you think Thompson and Batuli can have on the defense? Because I look at some of the struggles Tennessee's defense have had, two of the things you would you would pinpoint immediately are forcing turnovers and getting things lined up and, and getting the, the plays incorrectly. And I think Batuli helps with this, the latter of those two as far as you know getting everybody set because he's, he's the, essentially the quarterback of the defense. He, he's the most experienced guy to have on defense. He's the middle linebacker. He gets everything set up, especially in the front seven. And then Bryce Thompson is probably Tennessee last year, at least was Tennessee's best uh, turnover forcer. I think he could really help Tennessee in that regard this year. So I, I think it could have a significant impact. Do I, do I think it's going to make Tennessee a you know, top five SEC defense? No, but I think it'll, it'll definitely help in a lot of areas where Tennessee has really struggled to start this season. Yeah, uh, there's no doubt about that. <clears throat> Excuse me, especially uh, with Daniel Batuli. Uh, I'll be interested to see how much Bryce Thompson plays this weekend just simply because Jeremy Pruitt wasn't very committal – committal to him playing a lot <clears throat> so um Bryce Thompson has definitely needed it in the secondary because of the exact reason you mentioned <clears throat> that being that uh, Tennessee has not done a great job of forcing turnovers through the first two games D- did not force BYU into a turnover and then had a fumble recovery uh against Georgia State in the season opener uh and Bryce Thompson was a a turnover forcing machine Last year, the true freshman had uh, a couple of forced fumbles, a couple of fumble recoveries, if I remember correctly, and also had a couple of interceptions. I believe it was three interceptions uh, that he had uh, last year. So uh, Bryce Thompson is definitely a much-needed um, addition to the secondary. There's been a whole lot of, well, if Bryce Thompson plays against BYU, Tennessee wins that football game. And I don't agree – it's not that I disagree with that statement. It's just I don't think that that's a fair statement to make because Bryce Thompson could have been lined up on the complete opposite side of the field because uh, even with Bryce Thompson playing, either Warren Burrell or Elante Taylor, honestly probably all three are on the field in that instance because you probably slide Warren Burrell over to the nickel spot. Uh, or I wonder, honestly, if you slide Elante Taylor over to uh, to play safety. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that they're going to uh, – Maybe this is too much of an extreme, but to be honest with you, Naja Warrior is kind of getting on my nerves. Uh, so I wouldn't mind seeing Alante Taylor slide to safety next to Theo Jackson and, and then Bryce Thompson and Warren Burrell be your corners. I don't, I don't at all think that that is going to happen, but I think that's an interesting possibility. Uh, Alante Taylor played uh, safety some um, during fall camp and, and throughout spring, kind of cross training him. But uh, my original point, just because. Bryce Thompson would have played against BYU doesn't mean that he would have been on the side of the field in which the 64-yard pass was given up. So does Bryce Thompson allow that big play? Probably not, but just because he's playing in that game doesn't mean that, you know, he's guarding that receiver in that in that situation. So, um, yes, he is a much-needed addition, but it doesn't mean that they would have beaten BYU just because you don't know where he would have been lined up on the field. So I'll be interested to see how much he plays. Uh, you definitely need him next week against Florida, so I think you have to get him in uh, and get him some snaps. That way his first snaps of the season aren't coming against Florida in the swamp. Uh, but I also don't think that you should play him the entire game. I do think that, you know, maybe – not playing full time against UTC should also serve as part of his punishment. You know, he 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 misses the first two games of the year, and then he misses some of the UTC game. Uh, uh, assuming everything legally gets cleared up in terms of the the stuff with the female and the stuff about shooting up the school, if that gets all cleared up, which it looks like it is going to, I think that that's a fair punishment. Um, and, and so, and then Daniel Batuli, I, I think he's a bigger addition to the defense than. Bryce Thompson if you had to pick one of the two simply because Tennessee needs him calling the defense getting everybody lined up and Tennessee was much better in the second game 
And I don't know that it's necessarily Will Ignat's fault that people aren't getting lined up correctly. I actually think it's the, the, the teammates around Will that aren't necessarily doing a good job of either listening or interpreting, and they're getting confused too much. It's not that Will is in there calling the wrong call. It's that, okay, this player in the secondary didn't receive the call correctly or just was completely confused and was out of line, out of Will's control. I think that if you add Daniel Batuli in there, he can not only get the call in, but he can maybe help get guys lined up correctly and then go make a play on top of it. So, yes, turnovers have been an issue, mm. but before before we get some turnovers, can we get the defense lined up correctly? <laughs> and again, and again, the the it was much better against BYU. It truly was. Mm. Then the the Georgia State game was just a colossal uh, disaster. But against BYU, they were lined up, and then they just kind of failed to make plays. And honestly, the defense played good for 59 minutes. It just didn't play good that final possession, and then they gave up touchdowns on back-to-back drives in overtime. So I, I personally think Daniel Batuli is a is a bigger addition to the defense than Bryce Thompson, although both are important. And honestly, if I'm, if I'm Coach Pruitt, I don't really rely on Daniel Batuli a whole lot this weekend because – when I saw him at practice on Tuesday, he was still walking around with a limp. And um, I would much rather see Danny Batuli out there against Florida than out there for 10 to 15 snaps against UTC, him irritate that, that knee injury that he suffered during fall camp, and then he misses the Florida game and the Georgia game and the Mississippi State game. I think that is a, a terrible situation uh, that would arise if that did happen. So I, if he does play, you have to watch how many snaps he is playing because he is vital – to Tennessee potentially pulling off an upset in Gainesville next weekend. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And before we kind of change subjects here, you, you mentioned you know, kind of Bryce Thompson situation there. and I, I want to talk about that for a second because I thought you made on, on Thursday morning here, if you haven't listened to um, the Swain Events show on Thursday morning, go back and listen to it. It, it was a good show, as it is always. But I, I thought today's was a particularly um, well done show by you guys. Early on in the show, you were, y'all were talking about you know Bryce Thompson returning and, and him being reinstated before his September 23rd court date because he obviously he went to court about sem- on September 3rd for his initial hearing um, and there it's when his lawyer and stuff were, were arguing about you know some of the the details of, of what happened and the, the the case against him about things he did or didn't say to his his I guess girlfriend uh, they were arguing and then of course about the shoot up the school comment Ben you made a good point that I I, I agreed with you that. To me, I would have been with Bryce Thompson a little more cautious, and and, and both and you and Swain both said it. We imagine, and I I, I agree too. I imagine Tennessee's done their research, and they they you know they have digged and dig, and they know what they're, what's going on. They 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 wouldn't have been reinstated Bryce Thompson if they didn't feel like you know the the, the next court date on September twenty third was not going to go in their favor. If 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 it was you know if they, they thought had any kind of inkling that it was going to go poorly, that any kind of thing would come out that you know, could um, derail the whole uh, case and it, it make bright, you know, stuff they weren't aware of, then they wouldn't have done this. But I thought you made a good point that, you know, what if, I mean, Tennessee, we've we've seen a, a, a sorts of scenarios of, of what ifs in Tennessee football, both on and off the field over the last, you know, decade. We've, I think we've all learned as media members, as fans to never assume anything with Tennessee football, whether it's good or bad. So I, I, I think you made a good point to me that, you know, if I were Tennessee, I would have put maybe been a little more cautious with this. I uh, had a little more, you know, I, I guess just be a little more careful and maybe not have reinstated him at this point until maybe after his, his date has happened because, I mean, something could come up and maybe the, could be blindsided. But I, I don't think it will. But, but Ben, do you think, in your opinion, I know that was obviously you know something you brought up as, as a thing to think about, but in your opinion, do you think Tennessee made the right move? Because um, I, I know PR-wise, we, there were plenty of people who disagreed with the move yesterday, uh, whether it was locally or nationally. There were plenty of people who were kind of chastising Pruitt and UT for, you know, bringing him back, especially when you, you know, the the optics weren't great when you had the big defensive gaffe on Saturday against BYU was a play in the secondary. So it, it didn't look good. I, I personally think people were looking too much into certain stuff and, and just kind of, you know, making some clickbait headlines and some, you know, just trying to get some interactions and stuff on social media. But I do think some other people have made some good points about, 
you know, like you said, like I've seen others say, hey, why didn't why didn't Tennessee wait a little bit longer and you know maybe wait closer to or even after that September twenty third um, additional hearing he has? So I, I'm curious in your thoughts, Ben. Do you think Tennessee made the right choice in going ahead and reinstating Bryce Thompson right now rather than you know waiting to hear another couple weeks until after his his second hearing? I don't know, and, and I don't say that to dodge the question, but yeah. I truly think that this is uh, a question that is better answered in hindsight just uh, just because I think it's best to kind of see how his preliminary hearing on September 23rd plays out. It, again, and I said it a minute ago, it appears that you know Bryce Thompson is in the clear uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the issue with the female. Uh, the, his uh, attorney said that his or the female didn't directly accuse him of violence against her at the scene. So that essentially cleared him legally. I mean, he may have, you know, she may have felt threatened in that moment. Um, but based off what she said at the, at the scene, it wasn't enough for Bryce Thompson to get in trouble legally. Um, so he appears to have hurdled that particular hurdle. Uh, and then, so it, then it kind of comes down to, okay, well, he, he mentioned that he was going to shoot up the school. And so there, there have been several, at least according to his attorneys, there, there are the witnesses that were on site when, when Bryce Thompson allegedly said that each witness kind of had a different story. So that tells me that legally, Bryce Thompson is probably going to clear that hurdle as well. So I, I'm not trying to dodge the question. I just truly think it is a question that is better answered, better answered in in hindsight, uh, simply because it's something that we need to see play out. Because I think it is a bad decision if more information comes out that you know Bryce Thompson uh, did something else, or he he did put his hands on the female. He he did um, say ri- ridiculous things. If the comment about him shooting up a school is true. If if any of that comes out, then it is absolutely a bad decision uh, to bring Bryce Thompson back before his hearing. Uh, I I get what Jeremy Pruitt was saying after practice that he needs to be around the team, um, be be within the walls of the program to, to be in a structured format that that will help him. And I agree with that. But from from Tennessee's perspective. In order to protect Tennessee, I'm surprised that they brought him back before the hearing. I, I don't necessarily agree with it. I don't necessarily disagree with it. I'm kind of in the middle until we see how it all plays out. But I, I'm just – my overall thought is that I'm just simply surprised that they brought him back before the hearing. We rarely ever, ever, ever see that happen in any sport when any athlete gets in trouble. So I, I was I, I was very surprised to, to see the news – on Wednesday afternoon drop that he he was going to be practicing with the team yesterday. That was very surprising to me. So, uh, again, just just to clear the air, I don't agree or disagree. I don't think Pruitt made a wrong decision. I don't think he necessarily made the right decision. I just think it's something that we'll have to see play out. And hopefully Tennessee has crossed all its T's and dotted all of its I's and truly have a firm grasp of the situation because I tell you what, if, it, if other information comes out and Bryce Thompson should not be practicing with the team right now, oh, Tennessee is going to be in a world of hurt. Yes, absolutely. Not just from a PR perspective. I mean, they, they could be facing, you know, lots of other issues. But, but that's a it's, just, it's a very nuanced conversation to have because it's one of those things that, I mean, there aren't really – there isn't really a, a black and white situation. There's a lot of gray in this situation. There's a lot of topics to discuss I, I, like you said, I don't really fault anyone who thinks this is the right decision. I don't fault anyone who thinks this is the wrong decision. Um, I, I've heard, you know, some of the listeners to you all show this morning are saying that they think it's the right choice. And I remember at least one, at least one person saying that if, if they were on the team, if they were the coach, Bryce Thompson would have been kicked off the team. And you know, that, that thing, that's, that's not, that's, that's fair too. I mean, it really is that with the, the comments he made or you know, whether he did or didn't make them, the fact that anyone even thought that they heard him say it, I mean, those are pretty pretty serious uh, comments to be making. Um, from so even if you're at angry, I don't, I don't care what the excuse is. You know, I've gotten angry. I've never once yelled, "I'm going to shoot up wherever I'm at." So, we'll we'll see. And and Ben, I think this is a conversation we'll definitely have, like you said, down the line after the date. And and if anything else comes out, 
we'll obviously cover it and talk about it. But hopefully this is a conversation that, you know, doesn't really need to be brought up a whole lot after this. Uh, hopefully if he needs, you know, any kind of assistance, if he has, you know, does have kind of anger issues class or needs to have, you know, couples counseling with his girlfriend or whatever it is, it, hopefully if he needs any sort of help, Tennessee is going to give it to him. And, and Pruitt kind of said that. He talked about, you know, he needs to be around the team. He needs to get back to practicing. Maybe that was a, 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 a way of getting him, you know, back to with his, his brothers on the field and, and getting him, you know, it, being suspended is you're very isolated because you're not allowed to do team activities. So you can obviously hang out with guys, you know, outside of football, but it's not the same. You're, it's it, a totally different dynamic. You're going to feel different around him and act different around him because he's not been on the field with you for a couple weeks. So I, I think it's probably it probably is good for Bryce to be back out there with his teammates and with his, his friends and buddies out there on the field. Um, like you said, Ben, though, if anything else, if anything does kind of blindside Tennessee and he's been out in the practice field with with the team the whole time, then whew, that's uh, it's not going to be good. But we'll talk about that, you know, if or anything anything happens like that. But like I said, hopefully there no news will be good news, hopefully, for Tennessee and everyone involved. Um, and like I said, if anyone needs help, I, I do hope they, they get the help they need in this situation. But Ben, to to go back to actual football matters here and, and more on the field stuff. I thought Jeremy Pruitt made some very interesting comments this week about one specific player. No, and I'm not talking about Jerry Garantano. I'm not talking about, you know, that the whole quarterback controversy thing. We, we might get to that here in a little bit, but I'm talking about a guy who's, he gets talked about quite a bit. I, I would say, cause he, he's, he switched positions. I think, three, four times at this point, and he's only a sophomore, so he's not like a, a, a junior or senior who's been here for a few years. This is only his second year at Tennessee, and he's already changed positions multiple times. That's Jeremy Banks. Uh, Pruitt talked on vol calls, and he also talked on the SEC coaches teleconference this week about Jeremy Banks and about, you know, he's back at linebacker. He's been there for both the games this season, uh, but he just recently switched back there in, in the tail end of fall camp because of Daniel Batuli's you know, procedure he had to be, have done. So he's been out, and Tennessee didn't really have hardly any inside linebackers um, there to have any depth. So they moved Banks over there for some depth, and he's you know he's looked okay. He's he's flashed some really good potential on the defensive side of the ball. He has four tackles and a tackle for loss in Tennessee's first two games. The Brits made some very interesting comments that I, I think are worth discussing and dissecting here, Ben. I'm just going to read all the comments, and then we'll have a discussion. Um, on the vol calls, he said, Jeremy, he really, excuse me, Jeremy, he really wants to play running back, and he moved over to linebacker when Daniel Batuli got hurt, because basically we had about three inside linebackers. Unfortunately, Tim Jordan got hurt in the first game, so last week we only addressed two scholarship running backs, and that is against BYU. In my opinion, I think Jeremy could be a really good player at both positions. Obviously, on the offensive side, he's got to learn to hold on to the football a little bit. Defensively, I think if we, he played linebacker full time, he could be as good as any linebacker I've ever coached. That's a decision that we've got to make moving forward. And then Bob Kessling, I think, asked a follow-up question about um, Banks to him. And then Pruitt says, you just want to figure out what's best for him in the future. But one thing I'll never do is get a guy to play a position that he doesn't want to. He's playing linebacker for another week, and we'll see where he goes. He could go over there uh, to running back today. He knows the play as an offense. During the SEC coaches teleconference on the same day, but it was obviously much earlier in the day, uh, he was asked about you know using Banks or, or Corvaris Crouch in a short yardage situation because Tennessee's been very um, not very good in short yardage situations so far this season or at the goal line. He said we've actually considered doing that. Um, Jeremy is a really is really a running back by nature. We moved him to linebacker just based on need. We definitely could do that at some point. It's also something we could do with Q talking about Crouch. He said uh, Crouch got banged up in fall camp, so it eliminated some of the opportunities to do that. And absolutely, they're bigger-bodied guys. We've got to do a better job up front, stepping with the right foot, getting our head where it needs to go, and get more push up front also. To me, Ben, the couple of things I took away most from what Pruitt had to say about Banks was, one, apparently Banks wants to actually play running back, and he's, you know, which is a different take than around this time last year where, According to Pruitt, Banks asked to move the defense after the Georgia game, and then they eventually obliged, and he practiced there for a few weeks. I don't think he ever actually saw playing time as a true freshman as a linebacker. He got a couple of special teams tackles, but then he moved back to running back um, in late October, early November, one of the two, and then stayed there all the way through you know, spring and fall of this year before switching back to linebacker. So apparently you know, Banks went from asking to be moved to maybe wanting to go back to running back. But then Pruitt also says that he thinks that if, if – Banks stays on defense full-time, he could be one of the best he's ever coached. 
Pruitt's coached some really, really good linebackers in his time at, at, at Florida State, at Georgia, at Alabama. Ben, I'm I, I'm very curious your thoughts on this because I've seen when I posted the article um, on social media, so I've seen a lot of people have varying degrees of opinions. You know, some people are saying they think uh, they think he should stay on defense because uh, you know, kind of what Pruitt said, he's, he's flashed ability there. It looks like he could be a really good player on defense. But then also, some people are saying, hey, Tennessee needs some help at the running back position right now as far as getting some big guys in here and in the short yarder situations. Ben, I'm curious what you think. I guess, I guess it's kind of a two-pronged question here. One, where do you think Banks ends up? And then two, where do you prefer he ends up? So where do you think he actually ends up? And then in your opinion, if you were the head coach or if you were um, if you were Jeremy Banks, where would you want to see him? I think he'll stay on the defensive side of the ball. And that's where I want to see him on the defensive side, is on the defensive side of the ball. If he's at running back, he is fourth string right now. He's not playing over Eric Gray. He's not playing over Ty Chandler. And he's not playing over Tim Jordan. Would Jeremy Banks be a nice addition in short yardage situations? Yes, absolutely. Uh, But with the running backs, I'm also of the belief that it would help if the offensive line got a good enough push in short yardage situations. The offensive line was much better uh, running the football. Obviously, they were very successful doing it against BYU. But if you go back and look on in short yardage situations, they didn't really play all that well. The the guards and the center mm-hmm. really struggled, got pushed back into Ty Chandler or Eric Gray on multiple occasions. Uh, the fourth and one calls didn't go their way because they could not generate a push up front. Uh, so would it be helpful for Jeremy Banks or Kovar Scrouch to, to be at running back in short yardage situations? Absolutely. But I'm also of the belief, and it's not you know, a, a, a bulletproof concept, but I think Tennessee can make do with Eric Gray, Ty Chandler, and Tim Jordan if the offensive line can just get a consistent push up front. I, I truly believe that. They can at least pick up one yard. Um, again, it does help with the bigger backs, but – I think the back that Tennessee has, they are capable of picking up one yard uh, on, on most occasions if the offensive line can generate a push and not just get blown off the ball and back into them. That happens so many times through the first two weeks of the season. So um, I don't think Banks would play over the three guys that are at running back right now. And on top of that, as Pruitt said, he, he could be one of the best linebackers Pruitt has ever coached. And uh, I 100% believe Pruitt when he says that because I've had multiple people tell me that in practice he's a much better linebacker than he is a running back. So maybe it is a case where um, Jeremy Banks doesn't want to move. I mean, does want to move to running back, but if, if he wants to play at the next level, I would. I think it would be in his best interest uh, to play linebacker. Uh, so uh, I, I think he'll stay uh, at linebacker because of the depth chart situation at running back I don't think he'll receive the amount of playing time that he thinks he would especially if he hasn't corrected the the ball security issue whereas you look on the defensive side of the ball and he's already on the second team and he went through pretty much all fall camp without even practicing at the position I think that's very telling of the depth situation at inside linebacker Uh, and we'll see what happens when Daniel Batuli comes back does uh, a does Henry Tolotowo or Will Ignat get bumped to second team? I have to imagine it'll be Will Ignat. Mm-hmm. And then that begs the question, does Shannon Reed or Jeremy Banks get bumped from second team to third team? I don't know which um, which move will be made. I kind of think that Shannon Reed will get bumped, but we'll see what happens. Uh, so I, I think for, for depth issues, I think it's best he stays at linebacker for the team. And then for him personally, I just think it would work out better for him if he stayed at linebacker as well. I think it would be better for him too. It, it's the it's the comment Pritt made about him, you know, wanting to play running back that makes me wonder, you know, what his long term future is going to be because if if Pritt also said he's not going to make a guy play a position that he doesn't want to play. That to me is the only reason I'm I'm not outright saying he'll stay at linebacker because I agree with you, Ben. I think his I think he has a better future there because right now this season he would just be He's not going to be your bell cat running back. He's not going to be the guy getting. He's, not, he's he will be lucky to even get ten touches a game with the kind of running back 
the room that Tennessee has right now because you know last week you only had Ty Chandler and Eric Gray, but then you're going to have Tim Jordan back, and if he stays healthy, he's going to you know he's going to demand a few touches here and there. Uh, Ty Chandler and Eric Gray are just a, a dynamic duo, and they're really good. You're, you'd be having Banks in there in short yarded situations, and then in those moments, I mean the defense is going to know what to what what to expect. I mean, obviously you should know what to expect anyway on a you know third and three or in shorter. But if you put Banks in the game, unless you're using him as a decoy, and you're not going to use him as a decoy, but maybe once or twice when he's in the game, defense is going to know to key in on him, and it's not. I, I I agree with you. I don't think he needs to go to running back this year, or maybe even next year, because next year you're bringing in a guy like T. Hodge, who I mean has a very similar build to Jerry Banks, and I th- I mean they both look like linebackers. Banks is now obviously playing linebacker, but they both look like kind of linebackers playing running back. T. Hodge is a big guy. I, I think they want to have him on offense because they've realized this year, uh, especially, they need a bruising guy back there to help them in the, the short yard of situation. So I don't. I think there was talk about Hodge maybe getting some time at linebacker, but I, I, at this point, I'd be pretty surprised if he, you know, doesn't start out at running back at Tennessee. But Ben, I also, I, I wonder. We, we had a question. Actually, you know, someone asked it, I think on Facebook on on the the post I made about you know, when I posted the article um, about what. Pruitt said about Banks, you know, if he if, if Banks knows the offense like Pruitt said, if if he has you know if he still knows the offensive playbook and everything, why haven't I mean, why hasn't Tennessee used him in a short yarder situation? Because I don't I don't buy the, you know, his head swimming and things like that, and they need to keep him one side of the ball. I mean, if it's if they're just going to bring him in for a couple of plays, if it's third and one, and that you know the the defense knows what's going to happen, or if it's you know third and goal at the the two or the one or whatever. I don't see how bringing him in just to hand the ball to him and say, hey, you know, run straight, look for the hole. That's, I don't think that's how that's going to mess with his development on the defensive side of the ball. If he truly knows the offense like Pruitt says he does, I don't see why he hasn't already been used in these short yard situations. I, I'm curious if you have any other you know, thoughts on that because I, I, I don't see why he hasn't been. If he, you know, as Pruitt says, he truly does know the offensive playbook still, why wasn't, why hasn't he been used here in the first couple of weeks when Tennessee, they, they've gone, I looked at the, the stats from the games and third and short, which um, according to the metrics by UT stats, third and short is by four yards or fewer. Tennessee is only eight of 15 on third and short this season. I mean, that's not good at all. And, and you know, part of that's also the offensive line, not getting push. Um, actually, it's, actually, I'd say a lot of it's offensive line, not getting push, but, it's also the fact that I mean Tennessee doesn't have a big guy who can move the pile. Um, you know, as strong as strong legs as Ty Chandler has, he's still only five eleven, two hundred pounds. I mean, he's not a six foot one, two hundred twenty five pound back like Jerry Banks is. So, I I just you know if if he has the understanding of the offense that Pruitt says he does, I just don't understand why he hasn't already been in there. You know, it, it, you know not a whole lot, just a couple times in the last couple games. No, I'm with you. I think that's a really good point uh, because if he's just going in there for short yardage situations. I mean, he should be able to recognize the hole and pick up that first down. I mean, if A.J. Johnson can go in there uh, and pick up a yard or two when he needs to, uh, just a couple of plays out of the game, um, then I I don't see why Jeremy Banks can't either. Uh, Really, any middle school or high school running back um, should be capable of, you know, following the lead blocker in short yardage situations and picking the right hole and picking up a yard. Uh, so that to me, that is football 101, uh, especially at the college level. I, I don't think Jeremy Banks Jeremy – ben- that's not even Jeremy Banks' problem on offense. It's the whole ball security issue. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's not like he's playing 70 snaps a game on defense. Uh, he's probably only played 20 to 30 snaps a game. It's that. So he's got plenty of energy. So – I agree with with whoever made that comment on, on Facebook, and I agree with you. I, I think Tennessee should absolutely consider using Jeremy Banks in both roles until T. Hodge gets on campus. I don't see what the problem with that would be. I mean, obviously, more risk for injury, but I mean, he's not even a top three linebacker for you right now, and he may not even be a top four, depending on how they view him and Shannon Reed. Obviously, long term. Tennessee views Jeremy Banks in a in a brighter light, but in, in the immediate future, I don't know how Pruitt feels between having Banks or Shannon Reed on the field. Uh, so, I, I think I, I think it absolutely makes sense for Banks to do both because again, it's not like he's playing a thousand snaps on defense per game. He's got plenty of energy, and then you look at it offensively, and 
it, it doesn't take a lot to pick up a yard in short yardage situations. It's not a, a super complex, uh, you know, scheme that he has to pick up. It's follow the lead blocker, run the right direction, and lower your lower your head and pick up the first down. So to me, I think it's a great idea, and I think it's something that uh, Tennessee. Maybe you don't break that out against Tennessee Chattanooga because you don't need to. But I, I think it is definitely something uh, Tennessee should consider to, to throw at Florida next weekend. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Especially if it's you know it's some, if it's close in the in the second half against Florida, which I don't I don't necessarily foresee happening. But it, hey, it can. Tennessee has played some weird games against Florida here in the past few years, so it it definitely can happen. But if it's close in the fourth quarter, you're needing a, a pivotal third and shorter. If you're going forward and fourth down and short, like Pruitt's done um, here in the first couple weeks, I I would like to see Banks back there. Maybe they you know like I said earlier, they use him as a decoy, and then all of a sudden you know Garantano keeps there, or they hand it off to someone else or something. But you know. I, I think you got to have him out there in the short yard situations in SEC play at least once or twice. But then to you know go back to Pritt's comment here a little bit quickly about him saying that he thinks Banks could be one of the best he's ever coached. Looked up some of the, the linebackers that Pritt's coached, and, and just here in the past couple of years, you're looking at guys like Jordan Jenkins at Georgia, Leonard Floyd at Georgia, who was a, a first round draft pick. At Alabama, you have you know Reggie Ragwin, Reuben Foster, Ryan Anderson, Rashawn Evans. Roquan Smith. I mean, th- those are those are obviously some of the best of the best. But then Pruitt also said he thinks Jeremy Banks could be some of the best the best that he's ever coached. So, I mean, you're, you're looking at – I mean, those are some high-level first, second, and early third-round type of guys in, into the NFL that Pruitt has coached. And the fact that he thinks Banks, um, you know, has that type of ceiling as a linebacker, I don't – I mean, I don't, I don't know how he doesn't stay at linebacker. I mean, I, I, I would be – I would be surprised if he's a state linebacker right now, especially because, like we both have said, he's going to be – I mean, he would be, I guess, third string at best in the running back room. That's, you know, it's assuming if Tim Jordan you know, can't get healthy again or whatever and, and he, or he goes downhill because, I mean, he wasn't super effective when he was in the game against Georgia State. He was seven carries or 16 yards. So maybe, you know, at, at best he'd be third string. But, I mean, I you know, I, I guess realistically he'd be fourth string and – Right now, like you said on defense, he's been second string for the most part um, the first two weeks, and he'll 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 probably get relegated. I'd say to third string or, or kind of battling Shannon Reed for that that spot in the second string um, at inside linebacker right now. But he's still getting more playing time on defense and special teams than he would be at running back. But then to kind of round out the podcast here, we won't go for very much longer. Um, keep it a little bit shorter here. We're not going to give you much of a UTC preview because. We can overlook UTC. You know, Tennessee shouldn't be because they, hopefully they've learned their lesson after the Georgia State game. But we can overlook UTC a little bit. That This is a game where you know we should see a, a lot of young guys get a lot of playing time in this game. But then one of the questions I'm going to ask, um, we're going to do our buy or sell article on Friday because we're, we're not going to do a game prediction because, I mean, we're, we're going to pick Tennessee to win. It just would be kind of whether we're picking them to cover the spread or not. Um, so we're not going to bother wasting your time with that. We're not going to waste our time doing it. We're not really going to do a, a UTC preview. We, may, we will have maybe a piece looking at you know what we want to see from Tennessee in the game, but we're not going to take UTC very seriously. Tennessee, on the other hand, uh, they should definitely take UTC seriously after what happened in Georgia State. But Ben, one of the things that I'm going to ask in the buy or sell, so we can kind of you know tease that a little bit here. Do you think we actually see all three of Tennessee's scholarship quarterbacks take the field? against UTC because I, I think you almost have to. I think it would be almost a failure of a game plan or of a game if Tennessee doesn't get all three of them on the field because you have it you should have had a chance at least in the Georgia State game to have at least one of them see the field and you didn't because you botched that game and you lose it. So this is gonna be your only chance really and unless you know you get blown out by someone like a Florida or a Georgia or an Alabama, so then you're just putting some putting in some guys late in the game because it's a blowout and you can't come back. But unless you have those circumstances, this is really your only game until November to where you can get a look at some of these younger guys and actually get some some playing time to see what you have from these young guys at quarterback in case you need to make a move, you know, to bench Derek Garantano or if, if anything happens, if he gets hurt or whatever. But I think you have to get both these guys, and I, you know I don't, I don't care if that means pulling Garantano at halftime or pulling him in the second quarter. I don't care what it means. I think Tennessee's got to find a way to get a a three four touchdown lead early in the second quarter, and that way they can kind of cruise into halftime and they got to and they just get Garantano out of there. I think you have to get 
all three scholarship quarterbacks out there. But do you think it actually happens? Do you think we see Garantano, Shrout, and Maurer, or do you think we only end up seeing one of the backups um, on the field on Saturday? Man, I tell you what, this this is a, a conversation that I've been going back and, back and forth on all week because I, I definitely think Brian Maurer and JT Shrout need to get in a game. Um, both of them need to see game action uh, before um, – you know, Tennessee decides on who the definitive number two quarterback is. I think it would be fair to both guys. I think Saturday against UTC would be a, a great opportunity for that. Uh, it's unfortunate that Tennessee lost to Georgia State because they weren't able to to get the backup freshman in, as you mentioned. Um, obviously, the main objective when you play Georgia State, UTC, UAB, uh, is to win the football game. So that's a separate issue in regards to the Georgia State game. But in terms of the games within the games, the the goals within the main goal of picking up a win, that that was to get Brian Maurer in the game. That was to get J.T. Shrout into the game against Georgia State. And obviously they were not able to do that because they ended up losing that football game. But they have to, to at least play one quarterback uh, this weekend against UTC. I obviously think that they will do that. But where I've been going back and forth is – do you keep Jarrett Garantano in there longer in order to get him out of this mental rut that he is mm-hmm. in? I, I, I know people will disagree with what I'm about to say, but I believe JG has the talent to win uh, most of the football games on the schedule. And when I say most of the football games on the schedule, I'm excluding Alabama, Georgia, um, maybe Florida. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I think JG is good enough to win every game on the schedule outside of Alabama, outside of Georgia. But in order for him to be able to do that, Tennessee is going to have to get him out of this mental rut. And it may not even be Tennessee getting him out of it. It may simply be JG having to bring himself out of this mental rut. I 100% believe JG has the ability um, to, to win at this level. Um, and it's all mental right now. I, I, I a thousand percent believe that. If you go back and, and look at his mistakes uh, against Georgia State, look at look at his mistakes uh, against BYU. They're all mental. They're all pre-snap penalties. That they, they, I mean, not pre-snap penalties, but you know, pre-snap um, decisions. Uh, kind of trying to recognize the defense, uh, recognize blitzes, uh, and, and then during the play, as we saw on numerous occasions uh, against BYU. He's just late getting the receivers to football when they're wide open, or he just completely misses the wide open receiver. That's all mental. You can't really knock uh, another area of JG's game. He, he's fairly accurate with the football. Uh, before this two week stretch of Georgia State BYU, he's done a good job throughout his career of taking care of the football. Uh, he's got arm strength, um, and he's tough as nails, as we all know. The, the knocks against JG have nothing to do with his ability. It's uh, his leadership ability, and, and it's his ability to kind of recognize defenses pre-snap and, and make the correct call. So uh, I've been going back and forth on, do you let JG play the majority of the UTC game, regardless of the score, to try to get him into a rhythm going into the Florida game, to try to build up his confidence going into the Florida game? Uh, I think I lean that direction. If I had to break it up into percentages of, okay, what percentage – chance of riding with JG throughout the throughout the game to instill some confidence into him regardless of the score compared to playing both freshmen I probably would say 55 percent to 45 percent or 60 40 Um, it is very important that both quarterbacks play at least one quarterback but I think it's more important that you get JG out of this mental rut going into the Florida game that you build some confidence in him and also with his teammates on offense I'm sure although they'll never admit it I'm sure the wide receivers are kind of frustrated with the way JG is playing. Uh, Juwan Jennings should have another ha, should have another touchdown on his stat sheet. Josh Palmer, if if JG connects on the deep ball, doesn't overthrow him, um, and and then if JG doesn't miss him on a post at the end of the second quarter, that's two touchdowns for Palmer right there that he doesn't have on his stat sheet. So they'll never admit it, but it would be good to also build confidence in JG's teammates, build confidence. Uh, in Jim Chaney going into the Florida game. So I think that is more important because JG is 100% going to start against Florida. And uh, unless the game completely gets out of hand, 
I know it's not a popular decision amongst the fan base, but he's the quarterback the entire game against Florida and probably Mississippi State and probably Georgia. We'll see where things are at after that Mississippi State game. But I I think it's more important to to really boost his confidence, boost the offense's confidence, uh, and get him out of this mental rut rather than playing both freshmen. You definitely have to play one freshman. I'm not saying I'm not saying that. You have to play one of the backup quarterbacks. But I think it's a situation to where you pick who you think gives you the best opportunity if if it's not JG. Pick the number two quarterback going into the game and give him the fourth quarter and let JG play the the entire first three quarters of the game, maybe even a series into the fourth quarter. So that's kind of where I'm at. And like I said at the beginning, I've been going back and forth on it all week because I think in a perfect world, you be you could accomplish both, but I don't think that's obviously possible just because you only play 60 minutes. Um, but to me, building up JG's confidence is more important in the short term rather than trying to, to get both quarterbacks in there to play. You know, I think that, that's a really good point. Um, I, I think getting his confidence up is, is, like you said, it's vitally important for Florida because he's still, no matter what, I think he's going to be the starting quarterback for Tennessee. It, it's going to take him having – and almost Nathan Peterman like kind of outing against Florida for him to to get benched and I mean at, at that point you would like to have seen you know some of the backups get time and both you know more than one game or whatever but I think I would lean more with you that you've got to get you've got to try to figure out with Garantano what's his, you know what's the issue with because it's definitely mental it's not he's not doing things that we've seen him do at Tennessee before even when in his true fre- his redshirt freshman year when he was you know starting in 2017 he wasn't making some of the decisions he's making now and some of the poor throws he's making now it, it'd be one thing if it was just oh he was, he was kind of late on this throw or oh he missed it and that guy you know that guy was hiding in coverage and, and Garrett Towners didn't see him it'd be one thing if it was kind of a defensive effort doing it or if he's just missing throws because he was a little late or he didn't have the arm strength or whatever but he's just making I mean he's making decisions it's this it isn't just throwing late, which he's, he's certainly doing that too. But it's making some of the decisions he's making where he's throwing literally into double and triple coverage when you have guys wide open on the, the, the perimeter and he's throwing it into the middle of the field for guys who were, you know, covered, I mean, blanketed by coverage. And he's just, I don't know, he's making decisions I've not seen him make because there were times last year where he was very, I heard this phrase, you know, used a lot with him. He was very risk averse in, in 2018 where he, you know, he would kind of take a sack or he would end up throwing the ball away or, or, or whatever rather than kind of force it into coverage in a double coverage. He would still make some kind of throws you'd kind of scratch your head a little bit. For the most part, he did a good job of of getting the ball to guys, you know, when they're open and, and throwing a, a, a pass to where if his guy doesn't catch it, it's going to go out of bounds or it's not going to be caught, period. He's not doing that this year. He's making he's made some good throws. He made a good throw in, in overtime to extend Tennessee's drive. Um, and the first overtime period, uh, Ben, you, you kind of charted that in your final observations piece, which if you haven't checked that out yet, please go check it out at rocketopinsider.com. Uh, ben did a great job in his final observations piece where he looks at, you know, a, uh, a kind of a final look at the tape and everything from the previous game to, to look at what Tennessee did right, what they did wrong, and kind of chart some different things. A lot of times he'll chart like quarterback pressures and sacks and what Tennessee, how many, you know, how many pressures Tennessee allowed in a, in a, just a basic five-man uh, protection, six-man protection, things like that. So check it out. He does a really good job with that every week. But that was one of the things you tried to that. I mean, he, he had a good throw in overtime. He had some good throws in the first half. It was once he missed that throw in the second quarter, I believe, that you're talking about, yep. um, where he, that thing just really went downhill for him. And he was just a different quarterback for us tonight. And maybe it's his yep. confidence is shaken. I don't, I don't know what it was, but, I mean, it was just he was a very different player after he missed that throw in the second quarter. Yeah, he, he actually had a, a decent – first half was he great no but I thought Jim Cheney did a great job of putting him in advantageous situations to where it was easy to read the defense where he was only reading one side of the field a lot of play action that opened Josh Palmer uh, Jawan Jennings open over the middle of the field Um, he did a great job of recognizing um, this was the play right at the end of the first quarter and Patrick Murray did a great job of Patrick Murray of WBR did a great job of detailing this and kind of a breakdown that he put out on Twitter that JG recognized uh, BYU in a cover three, and cover three's kryptonite is four verticals. Tennessee was running with that. He had Juwan in the slot. He, he noticed that the, the corner kind of went with the receiver on, on the perimeter, leaving Juwan wide open down the seam. And JG saw it early. He threw it to him. I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't a beautiful pass, but it was – 
a pass that got the job done. And as a result, I mean, it's a 54 yard gain. So I know people think it's asinine when, when, when you hear it because of how he played in the second half, but JG actually played fairly well in the, in the first half. There were only really three plays that I jotted down when going back and watching the game with, in which I kind of shook my head at JG and, um, the first one was the very first touchdown of the game uh, when the ball was tipped around and Jawan caught it. And that wasn't even a, a bad decision. It was a bad throw because he had – Dominic Wood Anderson wasn't open in the back of the end zone, but good ball placement gives DWA an opportunity to come down with the touchdown. And as Swain mentioned this week, it, when JG kind of misses his throws, they are high. And if he misses high in that situation – it gets to the back of the end zone and gives Dominic Wood Anderson uh, an opportunity to to bring that ball down and score a touchdown. But instead, for whatever reason, J.G. misses low. It hits the linebacker right in front um, of Dominic Wood Anderson, gets tipped in the air, and J.G. gets bailed out by Juwan kind of snagging that ball in midair and coming down with the touchdown. So that wasn't even a bad decision. That was just a bad throw that led to that. And then the other two plays that kind of – made me shake my head at JG were the plays that you just mentioned. It was uh, the final drive for Tennessee uh, in in the first half right at the end of the second quarter. Um, Everybody saw the play where he misses Juwan late. Juwan was wide open in the seam for, for, I mean, from the 20-yard line to the end zone. JG does not see him, is late getting him the ball. Uh, Not only is he late getting him the ball, but if he kind of leads him to the right, Juwan's probably able to catch that, and that's a touchdown. And, And so he misses that. And then the third and final play that I kind of shook my head at uh, in regards to his play in the first half was uh, the play right after that. Um, you can't see it on the TV broadcast, but if if you were watching the wide receivers in Neyland Stadium in person live, I had a great vantage point from the press box. Palmer was coming wide open on a post. I mean wide open on a post. Again, you can't see it on the TV broadcast, um, but live in person, Palmer was coming wide open on a post and it was a single high safety that single high safety wasn't even looking at Palmer Palmer beats his corner or pe- beats his man I mean it, it good ball placement easy touchdown and Pruitt saw that and that was actually when Pruitt got after JG a lot of people think that Pruitt got after JG on the sideline there on the TV broadcast following the the, the play in which he missed Jawan it was actually the very next play after he missed Palmer so he missed Jawan and Palmer on back-to-back plays, Pruitt gets on to him, and then from that point on, he had a terrible game. So it's almost as if maybe Pruitt needs to, you know, it kind of thinks that this is the situation for a fourth-year quarterback, but it's almost as if Pruitt needs to kind of reevaluate how he coaches J.G. up. Um, Because from, from that moment on, where he really lit into him, J.G. struggled from that point on. So if first half J.G. shows up against Florida, Tennessee absolutely has a chance to win, and that's why I kind of think that maybe you need to let uh, J.G. play longer than you typically typically would to get to build up his confidence and get him out of this mental rut that he's in. Well, we could, we could go on and on with this because when we had a full conversation in the previous the first podcast this week about uh, about J.G. and everything, we, we could have a whole other conversation here about it, but we'll, we'll hold off and – We'll talk more about it um, after the game on Saturday or you know, in the podcast after the game and stuff because I'm sure, Ben, the quarterback play will be a big co- topic of conversation, good or bad, after uh, Saturday's game against UTC. So I- I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about there um, regardless of how the game goes for Tennessee. But we'll get to that when it happens. You know, Be sure to check out all our coverage before and after the UTC game. You know, Hopefully Tennessee goes out and there aren't any issues and they just go out and win it handily but after that is the Florida game and of course we're going to have all kinds of coverage about that one Um, you know with it being a noon kickoff down in Gainesville that's going to be very interesting to monitor Uh, I'll I'll see if I can pull it and find you know a way to look at you know what Tennessee's records are in in the last few years of um, road games at noon because Tennessee's had a lot of home games at noon but they haven't had as many you know noon kickoffs on the road but I feel like just from a gut feeling that road teams kind of have the advantage a little bit if they're the the especially the, the kind of less talented team they have a little bit of an advantage at least initially on the road if it's a noon kickoff you, you, you automatically obviously think to Tennessee's road upset last year against Auburn you know, I don't think we're gonna I don't think Tennessee's gonna find Florida in the same type of situation Auburn's in where they had kind of a, a a very upset locker room and everything that was going on there but 
I don't know. You never know. But we'll talk about that next week. We do appreciate you all tuning in for this episode of the podcast and signing off for Ben McKee. I'm Nathan at Rutherford. Thank you all for tuning in. Until next time, this has been another episode of the RTI Podcast.